He became a director of a Bond film on documentary. The title of the film is, if I remember rightly, is State of Siege. That's correct, yes. So tell us, how does it happen with an actor to become a filmmaker and director and a producer? Well, in the years uh, immediately preceding the um, destruction of uh, my neighbourhood, I had written three plays and produced them professionally in Sydney. And because of uh, my long career in acting, I had some understanding of filmmaking and I also, as a playwright, had some understanding of how to put a story together. So initially I thought, I'll tell the story of this little pocket of Sydney and what happened here. And maybe it'll end up on YouTube, uh, or maybe I'll just play it for friends or whatever. Um, but I quickly realized that if the story was going to have any purchase, I had to spread uh, the, the vision of the documentary beyond where I live. And so I began to look around at uh, what was happening in the rest of New South Wales, and I spread the story. I interviewed people in other parts of the state uh, and took on board their stories. And then I realized there was a history to this. There was a history to what was happening in New South Wales. How did we get to this point? How did we get to the point where citizens had had their rights uh, to determine what should and shouldn't happen in the place they call home? How did this ripping away of their democratic rights happen? And so I went back and interviewed, very fortunately I got an interview with Jack Mundy, who was the leader of the Builders Labourers Federation back in the early 1970s, late 1960s. And Jack Mundy and the Builders Labourers Federation, uh, I don't know whether you know, but were instrumental in saving the rocks in Sydney from demolition. Yes. They saved hundreds of historic buildings throughout Sydney from demolition. And, showed, and so Jack had a wonderful history of a previous government that had been as destructive and as dictatorial as our present government. So my story actually began with the days of the Green Bands and what Jack Mundy, Bob, for Bob Pringle and Joe Owens and others in that very radical union had done for Sydney and, and uh, Jack's philosophies. And I drew that story and then integrated it into what was happening now and then took the story back into the 70s again to show that actually in that intervening period nothing really had changed, that we were back to where we started. So the government in New South Wales, the state government, introduced the new development law to developing for developers and for the state to assess developments. And that law was doing something very, very wrong. In very simple terms, to put in very simple terms, uh, throughout that 16-year uh, year period that the uh, Labor government was in power in New South Wales, um, millions, millions of dollars were poured into the Labor Party coffers by the development industry. And their lobby groups had enormous power uh, within the parliament. Their power was such that they were able to change or encourage the Minister for Planning and the State Government to change the planning laws that had been instigated as a result of the Green Bands. The 1979 Environmental Planning and Assessment Act was actually a very good act and it had been instigated by the Green Band movement. But the developers were able to bit by bit influ influence the government to whittle back uh, community involvement in those laws to their advantage. And they had that advantage because of this system of developer donations into the party. Political they parties. had influence within the party. So with this influence all through the years, they get into the stage when they took away the rights and goggled the communities, and they have no say that's in, correct. The, in the development and that's redevelopment correct. of the parts of Sydney mm -hmm. and the suburbs. Mm -hmm. Tell us, you know, what was the experience of that new law in your suburb and in New South Wales? So what the consequences are now? There is a great amount of uh, disillusionment amongst the citizenry and a great amount of cit um, cynicism now about uh, so-called uh, processes. 
Um, to talk specifically about uh, where I come from, uh, a municipality called Karingai, and in many ways it's uh, similar, albeit it doesn't have uh, the advantage of the seaboard that the people in the western suburbs of Perth has. It's a, uh, a desire, if you like, a desirable suburb to live in because it's uh, very leafy and very often this word is used in a derogatory term by those who think that everyone there is a silver tail and they've got more than their fair share. And that's a, uh, an opinion held uh, also in the planning department of New South Wales. But it's a prime development area for developers. It costs them no more there to build uh, a unit block than it would in the less de desirable area of Sydney. In fact, there were areas of Sydney throughout the time that they were imposing these ugly blocks of units throughout Karingai. There were areas of Sydney where development applications had been approved but they laid waste for years and years and years because the profit margins were not what they would be in Karingai. And so they moved into Karingai because the profit margins there were quite enormous. And uh, there was another reason. Karingai is probably one of the safest uh, conservative seats in the whole of uh, New South Wales, if not the whole of the country. Uh, it is the seat of the present Premier of New South Wales, Barry O'Farrell. Uh, the Labor Party doesn't stand a snowball's chance in hell of ever get getting a hold in there. <laughs> and so, uh, in conjunction with uh, helping their friends in the development lobby, th there was an enormous amount of malice involved in wrecking the municipality of Karenga and a part of the Labor Party. Because of the influence in that suburb. Because of it being a conservative <laughs> suburb, yes. I mean, uh, one of the mayors phoned me one night after she'd been in for a meeting with the, the Department of Planning. And she said to me, um, she was going in there tr to try and negotiate uh, something, a, a slightly better outcome from the imposed uh, rezonings that they were putting upon the, the municipality. And she said, one of the problems we face in there is she said, they've said to me, look, you live in a suburb of Silvertails. They all have more than their fair share of everything. And frankly, we don't care. That simple. So that basically sums it up. That's very simple. So how does, uh, so what is the structure? We don't want to go into the nitty gritties of the written law as such, mm. but how the processes works with these uh, development assessment panels in New South Wales? Well, I'll give you the new, I, I, you know, I cannot speak specifically about your situation here, but you seem to have a, a similar situation, but I'll tell you what happened in, in New South Wales and specifically in Karenga, because you will see footage of this in the documentary. Um, the government uh, required of the council to create so many more new residential buildings, basically in units whatever the numbers were, I can't recall. So the council went back to their planners and they gave the government what they wanted. Each time they did it, the government upped the ante. More. It, they wanted more. <laughs> when they went back again, the government wanted more. There was a time when the only place in Sydney that there was as much development in financial terms and physical terms taking place, the only other place was the central CBD of Sydney, outside of Karingai. And uh, ultimately, the government said, now look, you're just not doing what we want you to do. And in simple terms, what they did was say, we are taking your planning laws away. We are going to impose upon you a planning panel uh, made up of government appointed bureaucrats. And they, in concert with your planners within your council, and during this period, your mayor is to have no contact with those planners. We're going to tell you what's going to happen in your neighborhood, in your municipality. And so in the end, the municipality and the citizens were, and the councillors were totally disenfranchised. And you see so footage. Locked out, from the, locked out from the process. Totally locked out from the process. Entirely locked out from the process. And, and the that's result not of, democratic at all. It's not democracy at all. No, it's not. And how but corruption get in to this whole thing? So we got these development assessment panels, which are making the final decisions, regardless of what the people really want. And how corruption comes in? Well, it's 
It's a corruption of process, actually. It's a corruption of process. The corruption is, the process should be that people within those local areas have elected councillors to speak on their behalf. Yes. They, through their councillors and through their councillors, should be the people who have the right to say what should and shouldn't happen in the place they call home. In fact, those people know better than the so-called experts and the disinterested bureaucrats. They know better than any of those people what should and shouldn't happen. The corruption is that we live, or supposedly live, in a democratic society where we have a say in what happens within our community. And when that right is taken away, we are dealing with a corruption of the democratic process. It's a corruption of process. The current Barnett government in Western Australia also introduced the development assessment panels in here, mm. which is comprised from two of the appointees from the ministry mm. and one independent. Mm. So two to one is the mm. ratio. So it's overweighted. It's overweighted. In favour of the government. And it's favour of the government mm. and the developers. Mm. So it's no democratic at all in here. Mm. Matter of fact, more dictatorial probably than your system in New South Wales. Mm. So what do you think why another government, another state government introduced the law which is failed in another state and proven non-democratic, very bureaucratic, dictatorial and corrupt? What do you think what makes people in power to introduce such laws? I think it happens because once the election is over, governments sing the tune and march to the march of powerful lobby groups and donors. Unless you have a strong third force or a genuine independent on your side within the parliament, you both basically don't stand a chance. Governments work on behalf of commercial interests, first and foremost. As Jack Mundy said to me when I, in, when I interviewed him, he said the problem we face with the uh, two-party system now in Australia is that both the major parties have been corporatized. They're not political parties anymore. They are corporate entities. And unless we get that into to our heads, we don't understand what's taking place and why it's taking place. It's like the American uh, comedian political commentator George Kalin has said, it's a big club and you're not in it. It's a big club, and you're not in it. Dennis, thank you very much for the interview, and wish you all the best. Thank you, Tivo. And good luck for your career as a filmmaker. Thank you. Thanks for watching, and don't forget, next week, Shadowboxing, same channel, same time. Okay.